Welcome to Food Access. We're going to hear this morning from Lauren Ornelas, who is the Food Empowerment Project's founder and who serves as the group's volunteer executive director. She's also the former executive director of Viva USA, a national nonprofit vegan advocacy organization. Lauren's been active in the animal rights movement for over 20 years after spending four years as national campaign coordinator for In Defense of Animals. Lauren was asked by Viva UK to start and run Viva USA in 1999. In cooperation with activists across the country, she worked and achieved corporate changes within Whole Foods Market, Trader Joe's, and Pier 1 Imports, among others. She currently serves as campaign director with the Silicon Valley Toxics Coalition. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And thanks for everybody for being patient to our technological issues. So um, Food Empowerment Project, I'm just going to tell you in a nutshell as quickly as I can because we don't have a lot of time what it is that we do. But we're all volunteer, meaning we all have full-time jobs and everything we do, you could do and you could help us with, um, with Food Empowerment Project. Um, but we are a vegan food justice organization. So we work on promoting veganism in different communities as well as talking about other food justice issues. So one of the big things we talk about is in advocating for a vegan diet, we feel very strongly that the treatment of farm workers is equally as important because we're encouraging people to eat a plant-based diet, which is grown by farm workers, picked by farm workers who are treated in appalling conditions, including in the state of California. Um, we also work on two other issues, which I'm going to go into today, and again, kind of quickly, just to give you a summation. So the first issue that we work on is access to healthy foods in communities of color and low-income communities. How many people are familiar with the term food deserts? So most everybody is. Some people don't like that term, but basically what it means, for those of you who don't, is an area where there isn't a whole lot of access to fresh foods, where you have more liquor stores than you have grocery stores. You have more fast food restaurants than you have your produce. So this is an issue that we started working on because I started reading a lot about it. And at the time, I had just moved to Santa Clara County, which um, the, probably all of you know is the Silicon Valley known for its wealth. Um, you have Google based there and Facebook is based there now. Um, but did that, did that area also have the same problems? Its history is of growing orchards where food was growing on the trees and was very plentiful. But I wondered if it was taking place there. So we decided to look more into the issue. One of the areas that I spoke at, um, not sure if you can see the sweatshirt, it's Thurgood Marshall High School. If any of you are familiar with San Francisco, this is in Bayview Hunters Point, which is one of the poorest areas in San Francisco, where in this community alone, all of their diet, all their diseases, the highest diseases they have in that area are all diet related. I spoke to their class about food justice issues, veganism, and served them all vegan burgers, um, which most of them had never even had a veggie burger in their life, didn't even know what a veggie burger was. Very skeptical crowd I had to deal with, who kept on saying, well, this is interesting. And by the time the kid told me he was eating his third hamburger, his veggie burger, that it was interesting, I realized he actually liked it. But when I spoke to this class, I asked them, you know, how many of you have family members who, are, um, who have diabetes? And over half the class raised their hand. Type 2 diabetes, which again is the one that's related to food. So we decided to survey in Santa Clara County what was going on there. You know, again, we knew what we'd find, right? We knew we'd find discrepancies, but you need to have the hard numbers in order to convince politicians and anybody else that you know what you're talking about. So we surveyed over 200 locations in Santa Clara County. And we surveyed them, and I know this is hard to read, but we had like uh, 12 of these sheets, and I know some of the volunteers who helped us with that are here. But we surveyed them on fresh fruits veg and, and vegetables, as well as canned and frozen. And we categorized them on organic and non-organic. We noted the prices. We just made general comments. But we also surveyed them on access to meat alternatives, dairy alternatives, if they took the EBT, which is like food stamps, how late they were open, the amount of liquor they had in their stores, if they sold cigarettes. So we wanted to get a really good base information on what we were talking about. So when we surveyed, this isn't too much different than what we found. We found that um, what you had were you had your grocery stores. Again, we, did, we compared the highest income areas to the lowest income areas in Santa Clara County. All the lowest income areas ended up being in San Jose. Um, and what we found were, 
and I'll go into this more in a second, but basically there are mostly the tiny convenience stores that were in the lower income areas. And the produce was moldy, old, not anything that you'd want to buy. There weren't prices on them. Um, a lot of the canned items were expired. Um, the frozen food was pretty much limited to um, ice cream. Um, they had milk. They, um, they didn't really, most of the fruit that we could count for was always located next to the beer. So it was always the limes and the lemons, which we really knew weren't for the health of the people who needed the fresh produce. It was for the tecate or the margaritas that were being made. So in the higher income areas, obviously, we had some students from San Jose State who helped us with this. And um, it was sad for them because these, these were students who were in the lower income areas. And I had them survey generally those areas. And they finally asked me, can we survey some of the higher income areas? And I was like, absolutely, you know, feel free. And they were shocked at the differences. And actually, it made them, unfortunately, a little bit sad to find out that their stores didn't look that way. They didn't smell that way. And one of them even said to me, even if I wanted to be a vegetarian, it would be almost impossible for me to, because it's so hard for me to find this food in my community. So we ended up, we released our report, um, which we have some copies on our table, but you can download it from our website, where we came out with the findings. Again, nothing shocking. We knew what we were going to find. Higher income areas had more access to fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, meat, dairy alternatives, more information for the people who wanted to know, am I lactose intolerant or not? Lower income areas did not have this. What we found was um, pretty much frozen food was non-existent in the lower income areas. Um, really, like, not even there. Um, again, the organic, you couldn't even quantify it because organic was pretty much non-existent there. <clears throat> the next one. And then meat and dairy alternatives. Now, for an organization like ours, we're promoting a vegan diet because of the ethics around the suffering of animals, and that we do not feel that anybody has the right to take the life of another being. That's why we promote veganism. But at the same time, you cannot ignore the benefits of a vegan diet. So if you have communities who are suffering and higher prevalence in any other communities from diabetes and obesity, and you're only offering them a meat as their alternative, it's only going to exacerbate this. And what's worse for us, which I actually go as far to say, it's, it's a form of environmental injustice, it's a form of what I call food apartheid, is they are absolutely denied products that are better for their health. When you consider that 95% of Asians are lactose intolerant, 60%, 60 to 80% of African Americans are lactose intolerant, and 50 to 80% of Latinos are lactose intolerant, yet they're being denied dairy alternatives in their own communities? These are the communities who need it. These are the communities who, by their health, need it, and they're getting sick because of what's being offered to them, which is milk. You can find milk in the liquor stores. You can't always, we found, mind you though, we found soy milk in the liquor stores in the higher income areas, not in the lower income areas. So, um, go ahead to the next one. One of the other, oh, sorry, next one. One of the other things we found, and this is something that unfortunately we have not been able to do anything on because it's a governmental, pro like a federal government problem. So if you look to the chart on your left, this is what the USDA, this is how the um, US government tracks the grocery stores. So if you just compare the areas that we surveyed, and you notice the higher income areas and the lower income areas aren't too far off. You got 55.4% to 56% in terms of the grocery stores. So that means if anybody goes in and they say, oh, look at these two areas, they're pretty much the same when it comes to access in grocery stores. They have about the same. But this is what it looks like when you actually consider what it was when we went into the stores. These little convenience stores are liquor stores, but they're being classified as grocery stores no different than Safeway and Whole Foods. That's how they're being classified by the government, which is outrageous. Literally, that's why you can have, in San Jose at least, and I know it's the same in Oakland, liquor stores right across the street from each other, because it's no different than having two grocery stores across the street, but they're liquor stores. Your food in these places are chips, sardines, pickles, and expired, and expired cans. One of the other problems we found, and it's something that we're trying to work on in a state level and haven't been successful yet, 
is that the prices were not marked on the produce in these little convenience stores. So if you go into Safeway and Whole Foods, of course you know how much 10 limes for a dollar, or you know how much the apples are. But in these liquor stores, they have some produce out, but there's no prices on them. So this is a problem, one, for those people who don't speak English. And it's also a problem for that it's up to whoever's behind the counter how much you're paying. That it's, not, it's not a set price as it would be for everybody. That's not going to encourage people to eat more fruits and more vegetables. So what Food Empowerment Project has done is we follow the environmental justice principles. We feel very strongly that a lot of problems have been made in, the, in this issue when you talk about food deserts is that communities, groups, cities, everybody kind of goes into these communities and they say, you need a farmer's market. You need an urban garden. You need, you know, they tell the communities what they want instead of asking the communities what they need. How can you go into a community and think something's going to be successful if you're not asking them what they want? So what we've done is we've done focus groups in three impacted areas in San Jose where we ask the communities, what do you want and what's going to work for you? So um, one of the recommendations, we, we tried to make very few recommendations in our report. Um, one of them was for a fabulous program in San Jose, actually um, all of Santa Clara County, got, called La Mesa Verde, which is now going under um, Valley Verde, which they teach the people how to grow the food in their front yards encourages their neighbors to do it. They do everything for them. They go to the, the people in the houses go to classes where they learn how to eat better, they learn how to cook better, and they learn how to grow their own food. One of the programs we recommended, uh, we suggested, was something to consider was, I believe in Baltimore, they started having a program where the libraries would open it up for residents to come in and buy their groceries online. So you would think that that would serve the community. But when we asked the people in our focus groups, what do you think about that? It's not going to work for them. Probably because a lot of them are as picky as I am, and I know what I want my apples to look like. I'm not going to order it online and not know what it's going to look and smell like. The people we interviewed said they'd rather walk with all their groceries blocks and blocks to pick out their own food. The next slide. One of the other things we found out that was interesting was that, again, we were serving people who were below poverty level on these issues, you know, and <clears throat> each group was different. But one of the things that was the same is they all were aware of veganism. And in fact, two of the people in these focus groups had kids that were vegan. We served them flacos. Um, if you haven't been to flacos in Berkeley, vegan Mexican food, they were like, how do we cook like this for our family? That's what they wanted to know. Just because they don't have access to this food doesn't mean they don't need it and they don't want it. So, you know, this is an entire population that we feel that, you know, we need to be talking to and we need to be working towards justice for them. So I am going to completely jump issues here, and I apologize. But this is another very important issue for Food Empowerment Project, and I'm trying to leave time for questions and answers. Um, but we work on trying to encourage people not to buy chocolate from the, the slavery industry. Um, 70 to, 75 to 80 percent of the world's cocoa comes from West Africa. And here you have... Um, it's the Ivory Coast and Ghana is where it's coming from. Now, I first got interested in this issue, you can change slides, when I saw a documentary where they were interviewing somebody who had escaped from the slave trade in West Africa, and they asked him, what would you say to a Westerner who still eats chocolate? And he said, I would tell them they're biting into my suffering, they're biting into my flesh. And as a vegan, I thought, my God, that's the same thing an animal would say to somebody. How can I still consume chocolate that be coming from slavery? Child slaves, no less. So Food Empowerment Project has been working on this issue, and I'm going to get this really short because I don't know how much time we have. But um, where you have children from Burkina Faso and Mali who are actually, say they're in the market with their family, they're actually kidnapped from their family and forced to work in these fields. But these are two very, very poor countries. So what you have is not only are the children kidnapped and made to work in these slave fields, you also have family members possibly selling their nephew or their niece into the industry. You also have families encouraging the children to go into these fields thinking that they're going to make money. When in fact what happens to them is they're locked in at night. If they try to escape, they're beaten or they're killed. When they're working, and this is, this is how it is, this is incredibly common in West Africa. Um, they're exposed to different agricultural chemicals that are sprayed upon them. Go to the next one. 
they have to cut these cacao pods from the trees. These are kids carrying machetes. A lot of the children have scars all over their legs from, from wielding these weapons. And they also, the next slide, have to carry very heavy loads. If they aren't moving fast enough, they'll be beaten. They'll be pushed until they can move fast enough. So this is a very important issue for Food Empowerment Project, and we feel as vegans, as people who care about their food choices, you know, it's one thing to say your chocolate's cruelty-free because it doesn't consume, have any animal products in it. You can't say it's cruelty-free if it is the slavery of children who are picking those beans. So if you go to our next slide, what we've done, um, and actually one of our volunteers who's been helping with this is here, um, we have a list on our website of the chocolate that's all vegan. Again, we're only a vegan organization, so only the chocolate on our list is vegan, of companies that we recommend. And what this means is these are companies who have disclosed to us where they're sourcing their cacao, meaning it's not coming from West Africa. So I'd love to tell you, like I used to tell people years ago, if it has fair trade on it, you're fine. Sorry, they found child slaves in the fair trade fields in Ghana. No, just because it's fair trade does not make our list. It's all about where it's sourced from. We also have companies that we cannot recommend and we tell you why. So Cliff Bar, as you can see on the top of our list, will not disclose to us where they're sourcing, where the cacao is coming from. Mind you, we're not asking them for, tell us the name of the farm, the city, the street address. We are simply asking for country of origin. We also have the companies that did not even respond to us. A lot of these companies make vegan products. If companies you like are on these lists, we encourage you to write them and ask them, why not? Endangered Species responded to a customer. Alter Eco responded to a customer just by their customer saying, why are you not disclosing this information? We currently have a campaign right now against Cliff Bar. We're asking people, you know, this, this is what they say that they care about. But they're not living up to this message. They're based here in our community. They get away with having this very progressive message, but where are they living up to it? So we're asking people to encourage Cliff Parr to raise the bar on child slavery. We're just asking them to disclose country of origin. They'll write you back and they will tell you, we're working with Rainforest Alliance and we're part of the World Cocoa Foundation. That's been, you know, good for them. We have problems with both of those, but that's not what we're asking. You write them back and you say, all we're asking for is disclosure of country of origin. That's all we want to know. So we have on our website a place where you can email them and also their mailing address. So we also have our website, foodispower.org. Everything that I talk about, we have a brochure on our table that has a snippet of all this. Our website is fully referenced, goes into all of these issues, different slavery issues involving food, um, all the animal issues are covered in depth, including just information about how animals are when they're not in factory farms, because that's why we care about them, right? We love them as individuals. We want people to know that part of them, too. We also have a website called veganmexicanfood.com. It's in English and in Spanish. And um, we encourage you to please donate your recipes to us. We are all volunteers. I don't cook at all. So we want your recipes. We want pictures that you take of the foods that you make. And um, again, we want anything you can donate to us, um, including your recipes. So that's basically it. And I know I'm not leaving a whole lot of time for a question and answer. This is like an hour talk in like 20 minutes. But the main thing is that your food choices have so much power. And if you care about these issues, I mean, again, my full-time job is working on e-waste, you know. I can't chew, you know, all the computers I buy are going to be tainted with some form of abuse. But the food we buy doesn't have to be that way. We can make conscious choices about that. And that's the power that we have. And that's the gift that we can give the rest of the world is making a difference with the power of our food choices. So thanks, and we'll do questions and answers now. I think, well, I don't know as much about San Francisco in the mission, but I would say Bayview Hunters Point, it's not the same way. 
first, mission has been gentrified a bit. Um, two is that you have some really great community groups there, too. Poder is right in the area. So you've got some good groups there who've kind of been pressing this. Um, but I don't know. It may be that back, you know, way back when it was cheaper, and so a lot of these little mercados could open and they had it out there. But Bayview Hunters Point's not like that. And so... Yeah, so when, if with our stuff in Santa Clara County, again, I mean, it, to me, I'd love everybody to grow their own food, be off the system. Realistically, if they're like me, my mom worked two jobs, we lived in apartments always, we aren't going to have the land. Um, so it would be trying to figure out how to get these little liquor stores to change up, how to community, but we want to find out what the community wants. And that's really where it is. If the community says, you know what, we want to um, work into our grocery stores. You know, we, wanna, we want to bring those into the community. Then we need to talk to the city of San Jose and say, how are you going to change this? So we really want to find out what they want first, and then we want to get that for them. I think more than likely it's going to be getting these little liquor stores to clean up their act and be a part of the community. My hope is that, you know, we've got so much fruit growing on trees in California, which is amazing to me, that all that stuff could possibly even be sold in these liquor stores, money going back to the community. But I don't rule the world yet, but that would be my dream. We have one minute. Um, the fair trade chocolate, um, it's coming from a company that's fair trade certified that's not fair trade. Um, do you have any sense what percentage that is? It seems like it's very unfair that companies that are adhering to standards, that people who are abusing that are getting the fair trade certification. I'm sure you've looked into it. Well, I mean, to the credit, the fair trade people got the children out as soon as they were found. But obviously, there's a problem with fair trade. I mean, what I found out recently is fair trade does not mean the workers are paid a living wage. And if you're starting out with that as your premise, how is it ever going to work? Workers have to be paid a living wage if then they have to pay the people who are working for them. And there's talk about that. Um, we've, we work now closely with the producer, uh, the director of the film, Dark Side of Chocolate, who also did a film called The Harvest, um, which is about farm workers. And they're talking about tightening that up, that we're saying, you know, you can't, um, you know, people are trusting in the fair trade label. Our understanding is fair trade was really created for the coffee industry, and it's working there. It may not work for the chocolate industry. It's different. So... And I know we're running into somebody else's time, so thank you everybody for caring about these issues. <laughs>